Next in our series for payments in the time of COVID-19, I'm joined today by Brad Carr, who looks after digital finance for the International Institute of Finance. Uh, Brad, great to have you on today from Washington. Um, the IIF actually looks, in your role, you're dealing with the wide range uh, of liquidity at the banks right through to digital technology. What are you seeing right now as the trends in this space, uh, in, this, in the time of crisis that we're in? Look, John, uh, thanks, and, and thanks for the opportunity. Great to speak with you, and I hope that you and all of your viewers are, are staying safe and staying healthy through this difficult and challenging time. Look, I, I really see across the payment space probably three major trends of, of what we're observing around the world, what's happening right at the moment. The first of those is about the nature of the transactions themselves. And obviously, there's been a big shift both towards the cashless economy and also specifically to contactless payments. And in terms of the cashless economy, you know, I don't think this is new. It was, it was already underway in most jurisdictions. Uh, there was a great report by the Bank of England last year that profiled the shift that had occurred there, probably five or six years behind where the Nordic countries were already at. It really struck me last year when I, I visited uh, the Rix Bank's Governor, Stephen Ingers, and SEB CRO, um, uh, Johan Torgaby. And, and at that time, I didn't have to get money out of my pocket anywhere in Sweden. Everything was simple, electronic, cashless. And I think a lot of other places are rapidly catching up to that. Uh, on that same trip, I flew the next day to Frankfurt and uh, it felt like I'd gone back 20 years in time because everything was in cash payment around Frankfurt. It's, it's something that the, the Germans culturally have been much more focused on. But talking just to some of my contacts at the German banks in the last week or two, you know, the story there has been um, that, that rapidly people have been having to adjust to using cashless methods. Uh, as one put it, the pizza delivery guy has suddenly had to learn how to use the point of sale credit card machine that has just never been needed there before. So people are making that transition and, and making, making it rapidly. And specifically in terms of credit cards being used in, uh, at the point of sale, uh, when you go to the grocery store or the like, you know, it's, it's now overwhelmingly contactless payments. We saw that uh, Australia, along with a number of European countries, the UK, Croatia, Hungary, all re removed pretty rapidly to double their, their contactless limits. In the case of Europe, those limits had historically been pretty low. So it's been very welcome that we've seen policy action to, to raise those. Those are, I think, the really striking things we see, firstly, in the nature of the transactions, the shift towards uh, the, the contactless nature. Um, there was a great presentation by a, a Brazilian uh, um, uh, e-bank or, or neobank this week talking about their, their uh, innovation for ATMs where you now generate a QR code on your phone and you hold that up to the ATM machine so you never actually have to touch a button. Uh, we've seen a lot of very rapid adaptation uh, to help facilitate that from a, a health and hygiene point of view. Yeah, actually you mentioned Sweden. We did a cashless trip into Sweden uh, last year and I think we just missed you by that day. So, um, yeah, that's right, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, look, I, I, and look I, I think this, what we're seeing around the region here is that this cashless is also really prompting the, the prevalence of, of real-time banking as well. What, what are you seeing specifically in that online sort of space? Well, I think that the second mega theme I'd observe is, is more about the the underlying profile of the kinds of transactions themselves. And that's the big shift towards e-commerce. Uh, some would say, in fact, I think uh, Harvard economist uh, Megan Green spoke on one of our webinars recently about how we've been forecasting the, the demise of bricks and mortar retail for 10 years. And this might be where that actually happens. You know, personally, there's, there's you know, four or five dollars three times a day that I used to spend at the coffee shop buying uh, flat whites. And I'm not doing that anymore, but I'm buying something from Amazon pretty much every day. Uh, I think that's that's a common tale that there's been this dramatic shift to to ordering. Um, a lot of small businesses have rapidly adjusted with that. Um, you know, locally here in in the Washington area, um, it might seem a, a bit of a glib item, but the the microbreweries have all rapidly adjusted to being uh, you know, essentially e-commerce businesses. Firms that are not digital native by any means are, are suddenly adapting. But one of the things that that throws up then for the card schemes and, and for the banks is that the profile of transactions that they facilitate has, has rapidly changed. And so when you then look at how you try and counter fraud or money laundering and the like, where you try and use your machine learning algorithms, and we've done a lot of research uh, with our members at the IF on that area, of course, you're profiling or you're training the, the algorithms on a profile of transaction that's six months or, it's, or 24 months old. And that suddenly bears very, very little resemblance to the profile of what's actually happening now. So we do have some interesting challenges that get thrown up where you know, there is a piece to, to catch up in the, the data sets as they become available. 
that, that will happen. Um, but right now, uh, you know, there are some interesting challenges there, um, just given the, the rapid pace at which those, those shifts have occurred. Yeah, and certainly we're hearing about the, the chargeback related um, incidents that are going to be flowing through in the next few months. And we're certainly watching that trend too. Um, you mentioned you were joined us the other day on the, the ABAC uh, workshop where we were looking at open banking and, and you were particularly uh, interested in the, the fintech sector. And this is obviously what triggered this conversation today. But tell us, what are you seeing in the fintech a arena You know, when you look at the global picture? Yeah, so there's kind of a, I think a bit of a, a bimodal uh, event occurring where on one hand, the big tech firms are all you know, bigger and more important than ever. I mentioned Amazon as just one example. And we see all of the big tech firms, I think, having a really important role in, firstly, facilitating ongoing commerce. Um, secondly, as part of the health solution, um, in terms of some of the contact tracking applications and the like, I think they uh, are making themselves more important and more valuable to governments, as well as more embedded in our individual lives. And in that sense, you know, whether history echoes or rhymes, um, you know, there is, a, I think, a parallel there with what we saw from the SARS crisis in the early 2000s, where you know, Alibaba really emerged. You know, that, that was the trigger for Alibaba's you know, rapid emergence as a dominant e-commerce behemoth. So I see uh, some great opportunities for those firms, and I think they're capitalising well, and at the same time, continuing to generate revenues um, that are, in a lot of cases, others are struggling to do. At the other end of the scale spectrum, uh, it's a challenging time for a lot of the, the smaller tech and fintech firms. Um, some of them have had their funding models severely disrupted by events. Uh, it probably depends a bit on the individual firm as to what their offering is and what stage they're at. It's not a good time to be at, at an early stage or, or pre-early stage development. Um, so it, it's certainly not, I don't want to paint a doom and gloom mes message that it's, it's death for everybody at the smaller end, but it's an environment for them in a and a very different one to what it is for the big firms. And that really, I think, leads to the, the third mega theme we see, which is around, you know, what are some of the long-term implications for competition and, and market power when we hopefully get past this and move into a, a post-COVID world. And it may well be that those big tech firms are stronger than ever, that there's a diminished universe of, of tech firms around. Uh, and I think when we then relay that to things like open banking, Hopefully, hopefully moving beyond open banking to open finance and into open data. But I think, you know, as you look in that, that open banking world, um, it, you can do a lot of good if it's designed well. Um, you can do some harm if it's designed badly. The criticality of getting it, that design right, I think, is even greater now. Because uh, there is the, the scenario that if you have an asymmetrical open banking structure that uh, favours people outside of the existing, uh, existing uh, regulated structure, and if it's the big firms that are the ones that are able to capitalise on that, uh, what COVID really does is, is just amplify, uh, uh, amplify that situation. So I think that's an issue that, that policymakers need to keep an eye on. Um, and I think it's one that you know, it, it doesn't necessarily uh, upend the world, but it means that the criticality of getting those design questions right is just more than ever. Yeah, we're certainly seeing sort of similar democratisation in, in the capital markets area. Uh, and, and in terms of the capital raising structures and things like that. So there's, there's sort of the weightings of uh, influence and, and access are, um, you know, are being challenged at this time. Uh, yeah, mm. so definitely, uh, yeah. Great to have you on today, uh, Brad. And, and look, I, I think uh, we've covered it. We've covered a whole heap in, in, in such a short space of time, but I, I feel that this is, you know, we're just scratching the surface here on, on, on this, but I agree with you too. It's, it, it's such a time to pay attention to what's going on because the seeds are being planted for the for the big the big uh, the big plans and the big changes for the future. Definitely, for many for many years ahead. Absolutely agree. Great. Well, let uh, stay safe and let's uh, stay in touch. And um, all all the best to you and yours. Thanks, John. Great speaking with you. Cheers.